My name is uh, Kevin, and uh, I am talking today about uh, user experience design and uh, UX in general. Um, and uh, I just got super lazy with this presentation. The, the untitled thing isn't me trying to be funny or anything. I just really couldn't think of anything. So, uh, so yeah, that's me. Um, there's my contact information. Hopefully, you can kind of see that stuff. Uh, that is the most uh, rugged picture I could find of myself. I am not a rugged individual at all, uh, but I like to play one with my beard. Um, so uh, feel free to uh, contact me at any time, email, tweet. If you send it now, I will not respond to you, but I will later. Um, and if you are going to tweet about this, this talk, uh, this is not me. For the people who like to make jokes, um, I actually had somebody put this on a uh, on a uh, on a uh, on my desk one day, and and everybody, if you can just bear with me for one second, my my uh, my presenter display is not showing up correctly, and I want to uh, make sure that I'm not messing anything up. So I just want to uh, take this mirror display off here. Ignore ignore all that. So let's see here. Secrets, secrets, secrets. Um, also, everybody always wants to know what's underneath the beard. So there's me as well. Uh, me and me and me and our our uh, our still current mayor, I believe, uh, Mr. Nutter. No big deal. I just know the mayor. I hang in mayoral circles. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I've kind of been hanging out in the Philly startup scene for a little bit. Um, I, I'm originally from the area. I moved back up here in 2001. And ever since then, I've been working with a startup in some capacity or another, uh, everywhere from development to marketing uh, to what I do now uh, at RJ Metrics and, uh, and, and, and really uh, for everything after Double Star, uh, which is um, uh, I'm a UX designer. Um, I do lots of other things, but my, my primary job is a UX designer. I am the uh, current uh, design director at RJ Metrics. Um, so a little bit about what this is and what this isn't. Um, I'm not going to sit up here and tell you how to be a graphic designer. Uh, that's kind of a hard thing to teach people in 30 minutes. Um, so we're not going to be going over a whole bunch of color theory or, or really any. Uh, we're not going to talk about typography or anything like that. Some of the things we will get into, just, just the skosh. Uh, is a uh, little, little prototyping and a, and a little bit of wireframing. Uh, but what this is about, it's, it's basically, it's a UX primer. So uh, if you don't know much about what UX is, what it isn't, um, that's what I'm going to try and go over here. And then uh, try to give you some things to take back with you that maybe you can use in, in the everyday. Um, so what is this thing, um, user experience? So uh, after... All the years that I've been doing this, for some reason, it still feels like this is a little bit of a mystery to people. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, the, the designers just get put in a room and, and we work some kind of magic and we, we, we have our little incantations, <laughs> lorem ipsumus, uh, and, then, and then we walk out of a room with, with stuff like this. Um, but, but that's not really how it works. And, and I think one of the common misperceptions of, uh, of, of UX is that, and, and it's because I hear things all the time, you know, people say, oh, you know, we need a really good UX, or we need to hire a good UX person, or man, that app has a really great UX. Uh, but most of the time, uh, they're focused on the UI. They're not really thinking about the, the, the overall experience. And uh, I think it's important to know that user experience is not just the UI. There's a lot more that goes into this stuff. Uh, and this is, this is a, a tale as old as time. You could, I almost worked in a Beauty and the Beast slide, but I, 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 didn't, I didn't know if people would get it. Um, but uh, you know, if, if, you, if you search the internet, uh, the internet will tell you that this slide has been done a million different times. Um, so, uh, but it's not. Um, you know, it's easy to get confused about these things because uh, the UI is what we, it's what we see. It's what we interact with. Um, in some ways, we, we, we touch this stuff. So, um, you know, and, and I think that part of the problem is it's, it's on designers. Um, you know, there's things like, does everybody know what Dribbble is? Anybody? Yeah? Um, so I love Dribbble. 
Uh, I use it all the time. I post on occasion. Uh, but it's kind of created this culture where designers are designing for other designers. And um, you know, you see these great dribble profiles and you see these amazing designs, you know, anywhere from icons to fully fleshed out UIs and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and it's beautiful, but the problem is, is that a lot of what's being produced uh, and posted on things like Dribbble don't really work. Um, they're, they're strictly focused on the UI and, and they're designed to get more people to follow the designer on Dribbble. They're designed for uh, recruiters to say, wow, that's beautiful work and hire that person. And they're designed for people to hit the like button. Uh, who can get the most hearts? And, and what ends up happening is, you know, somebody posts something great and then a designer sees that and then they design it. Uh, they come up with their own take on it. And, and we end up in this little bit of a, a, a vicious cycle. And then eventually what happens is, you know, everything ends up looking the same. And if you look on Dribbble, a lot of things look the same. So um, I put this up here. This is, this is part of a post from, uh, from Paul Adams. He is uh, the, he heads up product at Intercom. Um, but he has an article about the dribbleization of design. And um, so, so just an example, like here, here are eight weather apps. And for the most part, these things all look exactly the same. Uh, there's, a, there's a temperature, there's a little bit of a forecast. And if you look really close, you, you can't see it. I should have made the picture bigger. Um, but every single one of these things is trying to tell you the exact same thing. And that's whether or not it's going to rain today. Um, so all these things up here, you know, they're, they're, they look really great, but only one of these things is actually trying to solve a problem. And like, does anybody, can anybody guess which one it is? Anybody except Dustin? Yeah. So all that thing is telling me is that I need to take an umbrella with me today. I mean, there's not really, you know, there's no fancy UI. There's, there's nothing to look at. It's just telling me, do I need to take an umbrella? And that's all I really care about if it's raining. Um, so, you know, the UI, the way to think about the UI, and, and it's, it's an easy analogy, is that, you know, the UI is just the icing on the cake, but there's a lot of work that went into baking the cake. If I, if I talk about baking, you know, people understand there's an actual process behind it. There's lots of ingredients, and you need to do all these things really well. You know, you need to understand how many people you are baking the cake for. You need to know how big it's going to be. You need to know if there's any allergies or anything like that. You know, is there a message on the cake? Um, but if we don't pay attention to it, we end up with something like this, right? Happy birthday, Frank, Star Wars, <laughs> from your friend, Star Wars. So, you know, what we ended up with, we, we started out with, with, with what it looks like. It started out as a round cake. It was already a certain size. All poor Frank wanted was a damn Star Wars cake, and he got this horrible thing. Um, so what is UX? Uh, I'm going to take a drink while you read. <laughs> this is Ryan Singer. Uh, I have a little bit of a professional cross on Ryan Singer. Um, he, uh, he works at Basecamp and you know, UX is tricky because it doesn't refer to any one thing. There's all of this stuff that goes into it. You know? And like I said, we, we tend to focus on one of these things. Um, but there's a lot that goes on. So what is it? And sorry if this is offensive. I checked this with Rick beforehand, and he said it was fine. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so what is, what is user experience? And here's the long definition of what user experience is. Um, it's from Oxford, the Oxford Journal. Uh, they're smarter than I am, and it was on the internet. So it's true. <laughs> Bonjour. Um, but if we really break it down, it's just how people feel. You know, it's... it's, it's we're creating an emotional response for the people who interact with our products and services. And companies, you know, this doesn't necessarily have, it's just saying something. It doesn't mean it's an app. It could be a storefront, it could be anything. Uh, so now that we know exactly what's going on here, you know, what, what kind of things actually happen in the UX cycle? Uh, we have competitor analysis, something I think that some people probably do every day. I know a lot of people do every day, but they wouldn't necessarily think of it as part of the overall UX. Uh, personas, user flows, uh, wireframing, content development as it, uh, as, as it has to do with the actual UI. Um, so a lot of these things are pretty familiar. Hopefully they're pretty familiar. Uh, hopefully this isn't the only time somebody's ever heard of, uh, of competitor analysis. 
But um, a lot of times I think that, that these things get overlooked, especially when you're dealing with startups. Um, we move at an extremely fast pace at startups, and I think that we have a tendency to kind of look around at what competitors are doing or other people in the space are doing, and you know, they release this new beautiful app or website or whatever, and you know, we have this oh shit moment, and we say, ah, oh, look what they did. And uh, you know, we, we're just gonna rush out and you know, we're gonna try to uh, get to parity with them and we're gonna release a similar feature, but we didn't really take the time to talk to our customers and figure out exactly what they want, right? So uh, our customers might have different, different problems they need to solve. So we see things that look good and we wanna emulate it um, and uh, we think we need to do that too. But what worked for them is not gonna work for you uh, all the time. So, uh, the only way to figure this out is to actually do the hard work and to do the work and, and see you know, who we're actually building this stuff for. Um, so it gets overlooked a lot of times, but um, you know, it, it sucks, but that happens. And everybody focuses on just the UI uh, because perception is reality. Everybody thinks that you know, if it looks good, uh, that it must, it must work really well. But uh, that is not the case. Here's Paul again. I, I, I really like Paul too. Um, uh, yeah, so a beautiful product that solves a problem that no one has will fail. An ugly product that solves a real problem well can succeed. I think the, uh, the primary use case that anybody would throw up at this is Google back in the day, right? Everybody always talked about like the non-design design of Google and you know, there's really nothing. It was kind of a, a little bit of an ugly logo in a search box. It didn't do much, um, but it did a ton and it worked really well. Um, and sometimes design isn't pretty. I tell this to people all the time and uh, what I mean about this is it's not about how it looks. Design is not about how it looks. Design is about how it works. Um, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're designing an app, if you're designing a website, if you're designing a poster for a concert. It's, it's, it has, it, it's the, how it looks is great and it's what draws people in, but if I don't know where the concert is or what time it is or who the hell is playing, then I'm not going to go, you know? So, um, Design is about creating simple and elegant solutions to our everyday problems, but we need to take the time to understand who we're actually building it for. Um, and I think another important thing for people to remember is design is not just for designers. Um, everybody in this room has the, has the permission, did I do it right? Has the permission, I went to the Catholic school half my life, I don't know how to do it. Has the permission to, uh, to be a designer. Um, UX design and design in general is not something that should happen in a vacuum. Uh, like I said earlier, you know, people, people think as designers, you know, we're going to skulk away and we're going to go hide in a room and then we come out and this, this beautiful thing uh, kind of appears, but that's not the way it happens and it shouldn't happen that way. Everyone should be involved. Um, one of the things that I think is great about being in design is that I kind of sit in the middle of a business, especially at a startup. You know, I have to interact with everyone from sales to marketing to the executive team to the product team, especially uh, for people who are actually building products. Um, but I get to, I get, to get involved in, in everything. And, uh, and I think it's important that people uh, not only get involved in it, but people should actually care about it. So what are some things that you can do to care about design? BuzzFeed edition. That's my, that's my, uh, that's my link baity, my link baity title. Um, there's a million of these too. If you if you search for just anything, design or cat related, uh, you will find a million different lists with numbers in front of them. Um, so why 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 care? Um, number one, you'll care more about your users. Um, the more you get to know somebody, the more you learn about them, the more you actually care about them. Um, I think this is applied to pretty much anything. Um, understanding who is interacting with your company or your products, uh, the things you build, is very important and uh, it helps you empathize with those people. The user is at the center of user experience design. It's the first word. Um, but even though it's the first word, I would uh, encourage you to try something. Try to not call them users. I think that's one of the things that you can do, one of the easier things that you can do to try to get yourself a little bit closer to who your user is. Um, user is 
it's like this insanely impersonal word, you know. It's, uh, I think it creates a little bit of a barrier between us and the people who use the things that we create. Um, it makes us forget that there are actual people behind the screens uh, who are using products that we create. So we're all people. Why don't we try talking to them about people? So Disney refers to, uh, to people who interact with any of their properties, whether it be the actual theme parks or the website or uh, the Disney store or whatever, whatever it is. They're all called guests. And uh, when I was working a couple jobs ago, a guy who used to work at Disney came in uh, and he was one of our sales guys and we were creating this flow through our application and uh, I kept writing user everywhere and, and, and he was like, no, we should call them guests. And I was like, that's stupid. Why would I ever do that? Everybody calls them users. Uh, and then about a year later, I kind of started getting on the bandwagon a little bit more. Um, Facebook has actually banned the word user at Facebook. They don't talk about people as users. Uh, they talk about them as people. And if they're going through and they're looking at a, uh, a monthly active user report, which uh, I know a lot of people in this room probably uh, look at, um, then uh, they don't call it monthly active user, they call it a monthly active person or monthly active people. At Square, Jack Dorsey banned the word user and they refer to people as customers. Uh, and then they even go a little bit further, so depending on which part of the, uh, of the Square uh, ecosystem they're using, they're either a buyer or a seller. He has even gone a step further and said that anybody who catches him using the word user can fine him $140 which is like nothing to Jack Dorsey. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, so this is happening at a lot of big places. And um, I think that Margaret Gould Stewart, who uh, is kind of championing this charge at, at Facebook, and I think they started doing this like a year ago-ish, something like that. Um, I really like this, you know, it's arrogant to think that the only reason that people exist is to use what we've built. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's true. Um, the, the first person, or the, uh, the, the first step in, in, in uh, getting towards more of like a human-centered design is to understand that there are actual people behind the screens, and, and they are humans. Uh, we're all humans, most of us. I know some people are a little less human-like. Um, <clears throat> so another thing uh, that, you, that, that, that you'll, uh, you'll benefit from if you start caring about this is that your products are actually going to be better. Um, taking the time to understand what people need from you and how they want to use your app, not necessarily how you want them to use your app, I think that's an important distinction, uh, is going to help you prioritize what comes next. Um, you know, you might be looking for your next feature to build, uh, your next product to build. Uh, we kind of went through this recently at RJ Metrics. Um, so, uh, can I help you? Prioritize that kind of stuff and help you improve your existing workflows. You know, we go into a lot of this sometimes with this assumption on how people are going to use the things that we build. And, um, and, and I would say that the vast, overwhelming majority of the time, how we expect people to use these things and how they want to use them are extremely different. Um, and uh, so paying attention to these people and, and what they, they want to do in your app is, is going to improve your apps. Uh, and at the end of all that, if you, if you do this stuff right and you pay attention to people, and you make your product for people, you will end up with happier people. People. Uh, so at the core, again, user experience design is about creating stuff that people want to use and that uh, they feel good about using. Nobody wants to use a product that makes it feel like work. And I think we've all been there. I think we've all used these kinds of things. Uh, and it sucks. Um, so. What are some things that you can do uh, in your everyday lives at work to, uh, to, to, to uh, figure some of this stuff out? So I'm not going to go over all these things. Um, <clears throat> competitor analysis, I will leave up to you. I don't really have any uh, insights on that. Personas, that, that you can go on for like days figuring out how to build personas and the different uh, ways to do this. But um, some of the things that I think are a little more in the uh, mystifying front of, of the UX side of things. So uh, user flows, uh, wireframing and prototyping. 
And uh, we're not going to go like super deep into these things. And uh, there's nothing really technical with any of this. Um, so the first one, uh, user flows. And as my friend Dustin kindly pointed out to me earlier today, we should start calling these people flows. <laughs> it felt, he pointed it out, and it, did, it felt a little hypocritical. I mean, who the hell am I to stand up here and tell you to call people users and then start, or people and then start using it? So, um, people flows. Uh, this is, I think, what, what people generally think of when, uh, when we talk about journeys or uh, flows through an app. So, <clears throat> you know, here we have a, a process where I'm logging in or I'm signing up or I'm going through some success project process. But, you know, it, it's kind of a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a level up higher from a, uh, or higher level up from a wireframe. There's not really a whole lot of detail here at all. These are just kind of abstractions of what these pages should kind of look like. Uh, general things on the page. If you look at them, some of these things look almost exactly the same. Uh, you could have a user flow that has this same, you know, icon or whatever you want to call it, the same visual a couple times in a row. Um, but but what they're showing is is uh, you know where people where people interact and and the flow through the app. So uh, a couple things to keep in mind when you're building these things is uh, again, and I've said this a million times already, and I will probably say it a million more during the course of this. Uh, during the course of this presentation, but uh, you need to keep in mind who you're building this stuff for. Um, and also, what is the goal of what you want them to do or what they are trying to do? And uh, where are they coming from? And the last one is, uh, isn't always obvious to people because <clears throat> I can have the same user or the same person coming in and using the app, and uh, I don't have a $140 fine thing, by the way. <laughs> If I say user, you have no rights or privileges. Um, you can call me out on Twitter if you remember what the Twitter handle thing was. Um, so, uh, so where they're coming from, I could have the same person that's, that's using my app, but you know, if, I, if I think about a website, I could have somebody who comes in and they are a direct user, you know, did uh, just an organic search, or I could have somebody who came through and clicked an ad. Uh, it could be the first time they're in to my app, or it could be the second time they're coming into my app. So, how they're getting in there uh, is, is very important. Um, so how can you start building these things out? You don't really need much. Um, again, like people, people look at, at, at some of the tools and, and um, you know, there, there's all kinds of tools out there built for designers or UX people to, to, to build out you know, these, these kinds of things. And, they all seem a little unapproachable uh, because you know, people are like, oh, I'm not a designer, I can't use this thing. There's other ways of doing this. Uh, one of the ways you can do this in a really quick and easy way is to just write it. Um, write first is a great, quick, easy, cheap way of doing things. You can use a computer, you can use a pen and paper. It doesn't really matter. So what we're looking at here is just a simple, uh, simple flow. So I've got a welcome page and I'm giving somebody two actions that they can they can uh, interact with on the page. They can either create a new account or they can sign in. So now I'm going to go through my sign in and I've got two form fields on the page and then they can do two things there. They can hit the sign in button or the forgot password button. Um, and you can build out your entire app this way. Uh, when, we, uh, when we were building out uh, the uh, mobile marketing automation piece of, of what we did at Artisan, um, I actually sat down and wrote all of the documentation this way. Uh, before I ever created a wireframe, before I ever picked up a pencil and did any sketches. Uh, I sat down and wrote all the documentation and I wrote stuff like this uh, before I did anything. And it was great because by the time I started designing and by the time developers started developing, we had explicit instructions for how people were going to interact with our app. Uh, there was no question about how people were going to use this thing. Uh, so this is a really great way of, uh, of just starting this process out. Another great way, again, no technology required except the pencil or pen, that's technology, um, is the shorthand method. And shorthand was kind of developed by Ryan Singer, again, at Basecamp. And um, this is really easy. So here we have a really simple way of saying, if this is my screen, on the top I see what the user sees, and then underneath what I would like them to do. And then the next piece is what they see next and 
what they are supposed to do next. Um, and again, you can build out your entire, in, you know, small flows or an entire app this way. So this is an example of a simple to-do list app. And we start over here and, you know, I've got a to-do list. I'm looking at a to-do list and then I want to add a new to-do item. So I click add new item. What happens next is I replace that add link, uh, the, add, the add item link with a new item form. So a form shows up in its place. I submit a valid uh, to-do item and then I get a little success message and then it fades away and then I keep the form open at the end. So really easy. Anybody can do this. Uh, I encourage you to do this. Um, and even if you have a UX person on staff, uh, you know, this is like a great way to interact with them. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, people come up and they have all these ideas on how they want to do stuff and, you know, all these things drawn out. Um, but, you know, if you just focus on the simple interactions, it helps facilitate the conversation a lot better. The next thing, uh, wireframes. And wireframes really are just laying the foundation for your app. And I think the, uh, the way to think about a wireframe is, is that it's a blueprint. Um, we don't want to go too crazy on wireframes. Uh, you know, if we look at a wireframe for a house, there's no color besides blue. Uh, there's, there's no color added. There's no pictures there. There's, you know, it's just the structure of the house. We're not, we're not interested in what color is going to be painted yet. Um, and that's actually a pretty important part of wireframing because if you start adding these visual uh, these visual pieces a little too early, color, images, whatever, uh, people start to be distracted by those things and they don't pay enough attention to what you're actually trying to tell them. They don't, they don't see the actual interactions on the page or anything like that. They're just focused on uh, the, the, the pretty stuff. Um, it's the same reason why people, why people use the lorem ipsum text um, but I would encourage you to not use lower MIPS and text. If you're going to put text on the page, put real text on the page uh, because it'll actually help you more. Um, lower MIPSUM is great, but you don't really get a good representation of the content that you're putting on the page by just putting fake words on the page. Um, so <clears throat> again, keep things simple. Uh, keep things consistent. You are building out your actual uh, app using this. So if you have something, like if we're looking at CNN, and I've got one of my upcoming stories or the, uh, the highlight stories, you know, all these things should look the same uh, because eventually we're going to hand this off to a visual designer. Uh, we could hand this off to a development team and get them rolling a little bit sooner on some of the structural things. Um, so it's important to, uh, to, to keep everything consistent. And remember, the goal is just to focus on the experience. So uh, again, if you're going to add copy, add real copy. Um, you know, how can I improve the copy of the welcome message? How can I, uh, you know, get people through the sign-up process quicker? Does it make sense for this button to be here? Does it, does it even make sense for this screen to exist? Um, and that's another important part, is to figure out really early if you need the things that are there. And uh, this is a quote from Jason Fried, another base camper. Uh, I, I was obsessed with 37 signals for a long time and still am. Uh, but um, he has a, a philosophy when you're dealing with actually creating products to, uh, to take an idea and break it in half. And I kind of uh, take that and apply that to the UI. And I like to say, take it away until it breaks. So if you have a screen that has a bunch of stuff on the screen, uh, if you can take it off the screen and that app still works or that process still works, then you never needed it to begin with. And it's just more, more noise. And you, know, you want to you boost the signal. Uh, with the users, uh, people. Damn it! <laughs> uh, you want to you want to make sure that they're focused on the things that they need to be focused on, so they can get through using your app uh, in the most effective way possible. So, you know, just keep in mind these are just blueprints. Uh, they're not the final things. Don't go crazy with them. Uh, avoid adding a bunch of color and just be consistent. Uh, and then the last thing I'm going to talk about here is prototypes. And uh, Prototypes give us the opportunity, you know, now that we know what our structure is, they give us the opportunity to define and refine the actual interactions on the page or through the app, the transitions from page to page, uh, the general flow of the app. Uh, and we get to test all this stuff, which is great. Uh, most prototyping tools, again, are targeted towards designers, but you don't need them uh, to do this kind of stuff. Uh, and, and, and there are some really great prototyping tools out there uh, that anybody can use. Uh, 
But the first thing I would say is paper prototyping. Uh, this is super simple. Again, no technology required. Uh, just paper, a Sharpie, uh, maybe a couple of note cards. So this is a, a login process that uh, I did not make. Uh, but this is a login process. And you know, here I'm going to go and I'm going to fill out this user, uh, my username and password. And you know, I'm going to pretend to hit submit. And oh, I got an error. And now I swap that thing out with a, with a red uh, note card. Um, it just really gets, it gives us the opportunity to, to see how these things are going to work and actually interact with them. And if it's broken, if it doesn't make any sense, then all you have to do is crumple the piece of paper up and write a new one. You can make changes really easy to your app. <coughs> Another really great tool to use is Keynote or um, uh, PowerPoint. I haven't used PowerPoint in a long time. Um, and uh, I, I think that PowerPoint is probably, or not PowerPoint, but Keynote, Keynote is probably one of the most widely used prototyping tools around. Uh, most people, at least if you're using a Mac, uh, most people already have it. Um, it's really easy to use. Uh, you can create nice little animations from screen to screen or you know, when you're showing and hiding things on the screen. Um, and there's a great community out there um, of people that, that do this kind of stuff. So Keynotopia is a great place to start if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Um, you, know, you don't have to build out your own templates. They have templates there. Uh, you can get anything from iOS design to uh, Google material design to desktop uh, controls and stuff like that. Uh, it's a really great, really easy way to prototype your app. Uh, another one is Pop. And uh, Pop is really cool. And, uh, and they have awesome videos that you can take from the website uh, to show what it looks like. But Pop actually stands for prototyping on paper. Um, that's, that's, that's their little, their little thing. So uh, they actually sell paper products, and they have their actual app. So uh, it's, it's more geared towards mobile design. So if you're into creating mobile apps, this is a great one to use. There's also one called Flinto uh, that's, that's equally great. Um, they just didn't have really cool animated GIFs. So, um, but all you, can do, all you need to do is take those sketches that you created earlier on when you were doing your paper prototyping process, take pictures of them, and on the phone, you take the picture and you can actually create the interaction. So if, you know, if we look at the one on the, uh, which side is that on for you? On the right, uh, you know, I'm, just, I'm moving through this little process here. I'm selecting a tab at the bottom. I'm doing a couple things. You know, and I actually get to see what this thing looks like. And one of the cool things with this stuff is that uh, I can share this with somebody else. So I can start prototyping this out and sharing it with my team uh, really quickly. And again, because all, this, all the, the bulk of the work is just done on paper, and you know you don't need to make it look like this. This could be total scribbles. Um, but because it's done on paper, I can change this stuff really, really, really quickly. Uh, another great tool uh, that I don't have on here and that I should is Envision. Uh, Envision is definitely uh, it caters to the uh, design crowd, but uh, it is super simple. Um, so if you have a desktop app and you're doing paper prototyping, you could just take a picture of that, upload it to Envision, create the uh, interactions and you're good to go. So this is the stuff we need to pay attention to to make sure that uh, we create the uh, good customer satisfaction and loyalty that was inside of the definition up front, but we want it to look good. Uh, and uh, if, if, if UX design is the, the yin, then this is the yang. Uh, and I don't think we need a, a super complicated way of describing this. We, it's just, it's what it looks like. It's pretty easy. Um, so these are all the things that go into uh, the visual design side of things. This is where designers argue about font choices and color, and we get made fun of for it, which I don't think is fair because it's really important. Um, and I'm not going to go over all this kind of stuff, but I will give you three quick things. Uh, and there's no BuzzFeed thing here. Um, so three quick things that you can do if you're going to go down the path of creating your own designs and you don't think that you're a designer. So one, use restraint. Uh, just because you can use Photoshop and you can create drop shadows all over the place and you can use gradients on everything and you can use a million fonts, don't. Uh, it just confuses things. Um, a great example of that is, uh, is this. And it's not this. It's not this at all because this was great. Uh, it's this. Uh, this abomination here where they added a drop shadow to pretty much everything on the page. It's this horrific drop shadow, and there was insane fallout from the uh, design community 
Uh, my favorite one is, which one of you monsters did this to Target.com? Show yourself. <laughs> Shop till you drop shadow. Um, <laughs> and I think that, uh, I think a great way uh, to think about this is this quote from Coco Chanel. And uh, I love this quote. Uh, Before you leave the house, look in the mirror and take one thing off. Um, so that's clearly uh, geared towards the fashion-minded crowd, but you can apply this to pretty much anything. Be consistent. Uh, again, don't go changing a bunch of stuff. If you have a button that's supposed to look like a submit button in one place, make it look like that everywhere. Uh, you can use things like style guides to keep yourself in check. Um, you know, just keep a note of what your brand colors are, what typography you're supposed to be using, what your input boxes should look like, what buttons look like, different elements. Um, a good way to kind of get to this point is to take a visual inventory. So go through, your, go through your website, go through your app, take screenshots of every little thing. So if you have headers, if you have buttons, take all those things, put them on one, you know, if you have Photoshop, or put them in a PowerPoint uh, presentation or a keynote presentation, and look at them all. And, and I think you'll be surprised at how many things are different. Three, get inspired. Uh, again, I, I picked on Dribble a little bit in the beginning, but uh, it's a great resource. Uh, there's lots of great designs out there. Uh, if you want to get into design, there's so many different ways of getting into it. I, uh, I never went to school. I was self-taught. Uh, I started out uh, my career as a, uh, as a developer uh, many years ago. Uh, I always loved design, um, but Everybody can get into it, uh, so I, I encourage you to do so. Uh, so again, if we're thinking about <clears throat> UX in general, it's about being useful, usable, and meaningful to users. Uh, UI is a piece of that, but it's not, it's not everything. Um, so three last things. Uh, one, don't start with the UI. Uh, remember that this is all about the user. We don't want to end up with the horrible Star Wars cake. Uh, this is all about the user, and a great looking mock-up is nothing if it doesn't actually work, and your users won't get anything out of it. Two, you are not your customers. Uh, I think when we go through and we start building things, we have a tendency to build for ourselves and not the people who are using it, especially if it's the first time that we're going through and building something. I think that a side effect of doing things this way and, and thinking about uh, and building things for you is that um, if anybody is, is, is of the design or development or even business side of things, you, you tend to hear things like, the users are stupid, you know, they can't figure out how to use our app. And no, you just built a really shitty app and you didn't care what they were trying to do. Uh, so you are not your customers, you are not the target audience. And three, make time for doing this stuff. Um, a lot of times, again, startups were moving so fast and uh, sometimes design isn't given the same uh, level of importance as the development side of things because we're just drawing pictures. Uh, but hopefully uh, you get that that is not at all what's happening here. There's a lot more that goes into it instead of just the pretty stuff. Um, so make time for it. Designing and developing in parallel sucks. Um, you end up with some really bad experiences if you do that. Or you know, developing first and then designing later. Uh, you end up with something that just doesn't work um, designers come in and then they, they take a look at things and they say everything needs to change and then now you've just wasted a bunch of time. So make time for this stuff, uh, care about it, get involved, uh, and I think that's it. So um, <laughs> that's my prestige moment. I was just setting you up in the beginning with a picture of me. <laughs> the only reason I included that was so I could put this in here. It's <laughs> photobombing the mayor. Who gets to do that? Huh? Yeah, I mean that over time. We're good. Uh, so if anybody, I don't know how many times we have, how much time do we have for questions? Five minutes, that's perfect. Anybody have any questions? If not, I'll just stand here. I'll stand here for, stand here for 30 seconds. No, I'm not. You raise your hand first. What's your favorite app from the design standpoint right now? Oh, God. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, You're like, wow, I wish I did this. I don't know if I have any anything that's like any specific app. The, the, the things that I like and the things that I'm surprised at uh, more times than anything are the things that, that accomplish something in such a simple way that it's like, why the hell didn't anybody think of that before? 
Um, you know, you can look at like I I I, uh, I, I, I used Simple Bank for a while, uh, and primarily because it looked really nice. Um, uh, and for a while, I marveled at that. And and but I mean, there's tons of things that look really great, but um, it's things that that just work right. They work how they're supposed to work, and it's really simple. Uh, those are the things. So nothing necessarily specific, but um, so sorry, I didn't know. there's two in a row. No, 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 it was you. You, you were first. Right. I'm gonna drink again. How do you uh, address uh, an organization? So I, I'm um, kind of higher up in my organization, and then we've got uh, creative directors and software developers, etc. And we're kind of down the road where we have we have apps and, and websites, and I feel like we've gotten into um, uh, kind of a, a mode of like, yeah, yeah, we've been there, done that, we understand prototyping and, you know, da 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 wireframes. <laughs> and it's like, we want to, they want to skip ahead and they, they just start doing um, mock ups or they'll just like start developing the app. Yeah. And I, I, and I feel um, a lot of pressure to kind of go to them and say, look, can we go back to even before, before wireframes? Let's go to back <laughs> to like, what is the business process we're trying to achieve? Those kinds of things, and and I understand um, it's faster for you to just work in Photoshop and do this, or Illustrator and do that, or, or just like work right in iOS and you know, start developing. But kind of pushing them to to I, I guess do more of the the prototyping stuff and and um, work through some of those things before they get further along. What can I tell them? Uh, so one of the things that I was going to kind of talk about and that, that I didn't talk about is is kind of where this stuff starts. And I think you need to have a cultural design and I think it needs to start from the top. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I have a friend of mine and I said, hey man, what should I call this talk? And he said, uh, stop calling us UX UI designers, have somebody on the leadership team that's a designer and that's it. The rest of the time will be dedicated to questions. <laughs> like, that's what, he th that's what he said the whole presentation should be. Um, but it's true, like it really does, it, it starts at the top. And I think that, um, I think that if, if there needs to be a culture of testing. Um, at RJ Metrics, there's a culture of testing. There's a culture of analytics. Uh, we don't really do much unless we have the data to back it up. Um, and I think that that encourages us to stick to the process instead of skipping ahead. I think that there are occasions where if you're making a small change to something and it's just a, yeah, I mean, you know, you don't need to go through the whole thing. But um, I would say that skipping ahead uh, is generally leads you down a, b a bad path and uh, maybe encourage them to, if they're going to skip ahead and they think they can skip ahead, then back it up with the data to prove that, you know, you're ready to do this. One second. Um, so you said that your background wasn't necessarily in design that yeah. you were developing beforehand. And I was wondering if there was a project that you did outside of maybe your developer role or outside of work that you use to build your credibility and knowledge as a designer before transitioning into that yeah, role? Yeah, um, prof sort of. So uh, I've been, this is, I, I don't know, I think I'm going like 18, when did we figure this out? We talked, Chris and I talked about this before. Wait, the other old guy. The other old guy. I've <laughs> uh, been doing this for like 18 years and uh, uh, so I was doing this before like web design was cool. And uh, I actually had a job as a network engineer um, and uh, I was looking at the website one day and I was like, man, this really sucks. And I always really loved design. Uh, I just didn't want to do it as a profession because when I was starting to kind of come up, my options for design were like desktop publishing, you know, and I didn't want to do desktop publishing, but I always loved computers, so I kind of got into computers and I, I did a bunch of stuff, network engineering, uh, development, um, and I was looking at the website and I sent, I just started to redesign it and I sent it to, sent it to the guy who was the webmaster at the time. That's how old, that's how old I am. They don't have webmasters anymore. They're next to the brontosaurus um, <laughs> in the museum. But, uh, but I sent it to him and he was kind of like, oh, I see what you're, see what you're trying to do. Uh, and that kind of got me in the door. Uh, so it was, you know, these, these, these side projects, these personal projects that kind of uh, got me in the door in terms of design and web design. Um, and, and to this day, I still do that kind of stuff. I, I mean, I think that designers should work on personal projects and side projects. It helps, uh, it helps one, it helps boost your portfolio. 
But if you're just working for one company and you're just dealing with a single brand and a single logo and four colors and you know you need to branch out and kind of experiment with things, uh, so that's a great way to do it. But um, so so I mean that was my kind of personal project that got me in the door. Um, but if you're a developer, uh, are you a developer? I'm not. You're not. Okay. Well, either way, I mean, there's there's other things that you can do. I mean, attend attend hackathons, attend startup weekends, you know, stuff like that. Get involved uh, with with things like that, and you can kind of experiment with different things. That's something that uh, is really great. And you meet awesome people in the, at the same time. I think I saw. All. So it feels like every few years there's another trend um, that that comes out. Years ago, it's like hamburger menu icons all yeah. of a sudden were huge, and now everything seems very swipey. Yeah. Um, so how important is it to keep on top of those trends and sort of like adapt yeah, and update with them, but balancing that out with like what you've already established? I think it's important to keep up with trends because I mean some of them are good. Uh, the the hamburger menu is like a hot button topic in design. Um, I try to avoid it as much as possible, um, just because it's there and just because it works for one ecosystem doesn't mean that it works for everything. Just because it works well on mobile doesn't mean it's going to work on a desktop. You know. Um, I think trends are trend, trends are trends. I mean, they 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 come and go, uh, but uh, you know, core uh, fundamentals in design kind of stick around for forever. And I think that those are the things that are you should spend your time investigating. I don't know if that is that a, is that a non-answer answer. I don't know. Do we have do we have one more? Or? Um, oh, <laughs> gentlemen. Where in the process in terms of you know the or people flow, um, do you start showing your design to what would be your customer, like doing, I mm. guess, people testing? Uh, so I try to share things as early as possible. Um, and it might, not, it might not start with the customer necessarily, but I, I, I try to shop it around internally as much as humanly possible with uh, different teams to get different perspectives. So uh, at RJ, um, some of our heaviest users are actually our own data analysts. Uh, so, uh, you know, I might talk to some of them about things uh, before I actually bring it up to the customer. Uh, I've shared things at the wireframe stage before. Um, and uh, a great thing, like I was saying earlier, with some of these prototyping tools like, like Pop or like Envision, um, you know, you can take one of those wireframes, make a clickable prototype, <coughs> and send it to your users. and uh, Envision especially, it's, it's an entire platform dedicated to gathering customer feedback now. Uh, you, they can create little notes on your designs. and um, So I think as early as possible. Um, again, that's why some of the things like paper prototyping is so great because if you find out that you screwed up early on, you can, you know, it's a lot easier to make the change now as opposed to waiting, especially like with the web, you know, you can make th changes a little bit quicker, but you know, when you're dealing with like mobile apps, you know, you've got to get the developer to develop it. It has to go to the app store. It has to get approved. People need to download the change. I mean, it's such a pain to uh, to get a change put in. So early as possible. How do you ergonomics into a company? What's that? Say it again. Uh, how do you take ergonomics into a In which way? In your design. In design. Ergonomics in, in which way, though? Like what? Um, I, I guess just efficiency, like how is it complicated? Uh, my general philosophy is just to make everything as simple as possible. I don't like super complicated things. I have a little mantra for myself, which is uh, clever versus comfort. Um, I like to go towards comfort. Um, you know, I don't want to make people think about what they have to use. If you know, we can get, we can experiment with different things, but um, you know, a button is a button. There's no need to. Get crazy with it, you know. People are used to using certain things. So do you kind of stick towards the norms that are kind of already out there with people are familiar with? I do, I do, especially when you're dealing with enterprise apps, uh, because you know sometimes you're it's it's I don't know you, you have to you have to design for and develop for the lowest common denominator. So I think you don't know exactly who you're selling to. All I mean you know who you're selling to, who you want to sell to, but you don't know who's using it on the other end. Uh, and again, like you you have an expectation of who's going to use this and how they're going to use it, but they're going to do it however they want to. So, you know, I, I like to keep things as close to, close to comfortable as possible. It's the whole don't make me think mentality. Is that it? We're good? Thanks, guys, gals.